so I'm kind of taking a, a slight um, pivot. Yesterday, you uh, this morning, you heard uh, me uh, extolling about the joys of working in industry. Uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, for the next uh, 20, 25 minutes or so is my experience of volunteering my skills back out into the pro bono sector with um, an organization called Data Kind UK. Um, it's a charity uh, group that I have been involved with for past eight years. Uh, it's their 10th birthday this year. Um, so what we're going to try and uh, go through uh, is uh, who Data Kind UK is, um, what it is they do, and then kind of give an illustration of how data science can be used for social good um, and what's been learned by Datakind in the projects they've done so far um, through a specific front line case study, as it were. We'll go, we'll go through some of the illustrations of things that have been learned. Uh, and then there'll be a slight uh, call to arms at the end for those who potentially want to um, get involved if I've managed to do my job and sell uh, uh, volunteering uh, in this space to you all. Um, I won't spend too much time on this because you kind of got a briefing on this this morning. Um, I work uh, in uh, the financial crime, fighting financial crime sector, I probably should say. Don't want to put myself up as a money launderer. It's an anti-money laundering that, uh, that I'm doing in my day job. Um, I've long, as I've said, been a volunteer with um, Datakind UK uh, in many different roles. Uh, and part of the reason why I'm here and I've been talking to you multiple places is I, I enjoy engaging with communities and evangelizing about the things that I feel passionate about. Hence, I, uh, I'm a former uh, entrepreneur in residence uh, through the Royal Society that was linked back to the University of Southampton. I'm uh, launching Pi Data Southampton. If anybody's going to be down on the South Coast, our meetup group is finally going to start in the next couple of months. Um, and if anybody's interested, you can find me through a variety of media. Um, but more importantly, um, who is Datakind UK? Uh, they are a charity that builds data science capacity in the third sector. So they are working with charities, social enterprises, NGOs, groups that often don't have huge swathes of money, therefore can't just on a whim decide to go and hire a load of very expensive data professionals. But often they have data where which can help drive their mission forward. And so they're looking for is this something they should do? Should they be going off and seeking a grant? Should they be um, hiring somebody in? And where a, a sense, a way for them to get access into that space. Um, this is an example of over the years, the partners that Data Science UK and I'm, I, I, Data Kind UK has interacted with. And I keep mentioning Data Kind UK because they are the British chapter of Data Kind, which is an originally a US based charity. So if you do wander off to the website, you may on, end up on the Data Kind US. It all is all very closely linked, but the UK organization is its own independent charity as well, which falls under their umbrella. So just in case anybody goes wandering and doing their own Googling and gets confused. Um, but one of the things I like people to take away from this slide is the scale of the different types of organizations. You have well-known international multinational charities involved in things down to um, small little local charities that are just in the UK. Um, so ones that jump out here is obviously you, um, Centerpoint, hopefully many of you know as a national charity, but the Welcome Center, which the reason I highlight that one we're going to be talking about soon, is literally a small regional um, food bank in Huddersfield. So at all levels, we try and engage with different groups. Um, so what do we do? Uh, we, Data Kind UK is actually a small organization. If you look at its employees, there are about six people employed by Data Kind UK as a charity, but supplementing that is a core group of volunteers of, uh, somewhere like 40 or 50 people like myself who've gotten involved and we sit on internal committees, which scope projects or manage the community or contribute to organizing events. And then on top of that. I think we have something like a thousand volunteer data scientists on our books. It's kind of an interesting point. When you go around talking about data, kind of go, yeah, it's really hard to hire data scientists. It's like, yes, we're not hiring them though. We're asking them if they want to volunteer their time to do some really impactful stuff. And 
data scientists love volunteering their time to do really impactful stuff. So that is kind of almost the easy part. We have we actually had to start getting into the point that at some of our events, we had to start putting a lottery on the tickets. If we did it as first come, first served, it would be the same people every single time, which is not a good way to sustain a community. So um, it's it's as much as there are employees, it's driven and uh, very heavily in, uh, influenced by the community that it interacts with. And it builds that bridge out to, the th to those charities and those third sector organizations. Um, here are a bunch of lovely volunteers at some of the different events, uh, including in the bottom right, what happened a couple of years ago, we suddenly had to pivot from in-person events to doing everything online. Um, so uh, that is the, we, um, at, at our event, at, at the, the data dive events that we do, um, which I'll explain shortly, we tend to have a survivor selfie of who stuck around till 10 p.m. by the end of that first night, who's still hacking away at the data, and we try and get a group photo. And we managed to continue to do that even when things went on to Zoom, right? Everybody logs back in and gets back onto the, in front of the camera just before we, we call time at the end of the day. Um, and um, fundamentally, we have different levels of access. So we do uh, drop-in clinics that effectively charities can just book an appointment and they just want to talk data and understand, is this something I should be doing? What would be involved? Very, very light touch. This moves up to our data dive events, which are effectively hackathons, but nobody's in competition with each other. So uh, several charity projects will be in the space over the weekend. There will be 20 to 30 volunteer data scientists, data engineers, software developers who show up. And they are just going to maximally try and answer the questions and get insight back to that charity on whatever their scoped project is for that weekend. At the next level up, we do long-term projects, which last six to nine months with a core team of volunteers of anywhere from four to six, um, who are on average contributing maybe four hours a week of four hours a week of their time. And that's potentially moving into more of like an MVP sort of space. The challenge with that, however, is that the charity has to be prepared to take that whatever gets built on at the end. Because again, these are volunteers. So you can't ask for long-term support because that doesn't exist. So some of the lessons that we'll be going through is how you actually make that semi-sustainable tech that you can still hand over. But you have to have buy-in from that whichever organization you're partnering with. They can't just show up and expect it all to just magically be handed to them on a plate. Uh, so what makes for a good project? Um, Well-framed problems. Simple enough solutions. Um, oftentimes, we you know we're not talking about throwing the next gen LLM specially trained for a charity. We're talking often about you can't do it in Excel, or Excel is getting really complicated at this point to do this sort of analysis. And so you can have a lot of impact. There's a lot of low hanging fruit. They just don't have tall enough people to pick it, if you like. And so that's why you need that um, space. Lessons learned is that to have successful projects, you need to make sure that you partner with the charity early on to make sure you have the relevant data and you have buy-in from them and you're actually engaging and going through a kind of almost an agile loop in scoping the problem and making sure everything's there. Because when people show up on a weekend, they don't want to be going with, wait, what format's this data in? Why is it still in a Microsoft Access database from 1995? Nobody can load this onto their system because nobody's going to have a good experience that weekend. Um, so some of the key things that we try and do is we try and make sure that the, the, the questions become specific enough that you are actually asking valid questions that can be answered, that you're going to get actionable insight by the end of that weekend, if you're doing the data dive, certainly, that it's going to help you inform. And maybe it's informing a policy. Maybe it's saying this is a successful idea that we can go and try and get funding for to actually put somebody on this full-time or at least on a fixed-term project. And it should be driving their mission forward. And one thing I will say is the one project that we never take on is fundraising. We are not there to help them raise more money by looking at who's their donation base and who should we be targeting for emails. It's about this main core mission about how do they deliver better services or how do they understand the needs of the group that they're engaging with, things like that. So now on to some of these, the lessons actually learned from the front line. And like I said, we're going to go back to the Welcome Center um, in Huddersfield. Now, I should say up front, I didn't work directly on this project. I just love this project. It's a very good example. Um, 
So if you ask me at the end anything too technical, I will not be able to give you the specific answers, but I can probably direct you in the right way. But fundamentally, they are a local food bank. And the first thing that you have to do whenever you're going into any of this is what is the problem we're trying to solve? Now, the problem we're trying to solve is that people have to go to a food bank in the first place. Um, that's a really big problem, though. And the concept of a food bank, hopefully none of you ever have, have had to necessarily avail yourself of this, is that it's meant to be an emergency stopgap. You need some support now. Let's get you that support. But what you shouldn't be is dependent on the food bank. And so the concern that actually um, the Welcome Centre and other food banks have had is the fact that it wasn't becoming a stopgap. There were more and more people who literally were needing the food bank in order to survive. And it was actually, there was a dependency that was forming here. So how can they make sure that they intervene appropriately to minimize the risk of dependency? That's, that was kind of the, the real targeted problem that they were trying to solve. Um, and this kind of starts to illustrate, and I sh like I say, this, this project actually got done back in 2019. So some of it's a little bit more out to date. And so please don't hold me up for some of the numbers and some of the dates that you see. But what they were seeing was a growth in the number of, not just the number of referrals, but the number of repeat referrals that were happening per client. And so you can see this long tail starts forming and it's the long tail you're concerned about because that is a sign of dependency forming. Um, now, again, in this context of, okay, they are a charity, they're a third sector organization. They don't have a back room full of servers. They don't tend to have uh, gone and signed themselves up to a full-on AWS cloud account or a GCP system. So you've also got to figure out how is this going to interface with whatever they have and how are they going to manage it? How are they going to pay for it? How are we going to actually solve it? So whatever solution gets developed, where on earth is it going to live in that sort of ecosystem? Because again, there's a cost to that because it has to be managed and maintained. And so again, there's a skill set needed for that. And if they don't have it, then your project is already on to a loser because it's never going to get out of the concept phase because it's never really going to be able to survive in the wild. Um, so to give you an idea of what the typical journey is, is client gets referred by phone. The volunteer takes that call and registers them in the system. A food parcel is prepared, person shows up. So that's kind of your standard journey. Now that gets enriched slightly and this is where that extra bit of support comes in, is that there's a support worker who looks at all the files and then goes to talk to people that they think are at risk of dependency and goes with, oh, you know what, we need to sign you up to this benefit that you're entitled to. Or, oh, we need to go and uh, get you a, a lawyer because you're about to be evicted and that's going to cause extra problems. So let me get you the extra support you need to minimize the risk of dependency. Now, the challenge you've got there is you now have a human being reading every single referral that comes through the system, and they start spending more time reading referrals than they are talking to the people who need help. So how on earth do you start managing that? And so what they wanted was, can we put a machine learning model in here that predicts the risk of dependency that can auto flag up? to that support worker, these are the people you need to go to talk to. So they can stop, in some respects, reading all the files. They only read the files that get flagged, and then they go and talk to those people. So they can be more targeted in their interventions. Therefore, they can have a bigger impact on the ground where them spending their time talking and engaging with the people at risk of dependency can actually be helped, and therefore you can have that bigger impact. So that's what we need to do. Here's the challenge of doing it. They've got a 20 year old Microsoft Windows system, which nobody's really developed in. And their current uh, logging system is actually Visual Basic. Yay. I'm sure all of you have got loads of experience of building modern machine learning architectures inside of a Visual Basic system. Mm -hmm. um, as we kind of already mentioned, um, you need it to be able to run with zero to low maintenance and at low cost because they don't have huge budgets. Uh, anybody who's worked with data and data science knows that data changes, so you need to be able to update and retrain your models. Um, it needs to be a production grade thing. You don't want this thing falling over. Um, now, a piece that we I'm not gonna I don't really have time to go into, but the concern you also have to start having is on an ethical basis of you don't want to encode in sociodemographic bias 
because obviously you're not necessarily having the real positive impact that you're hoping to have. So making sure, so to some degree, one of the challenges that we won't go into is that you need to be able to ask the difficult questions and actually review how well the model's working. Um, you also need to make sure it's GDPR compliant because there's actually a risk here that there is PII sensitive data that is obviously already in the system. So what are you doing with it? Where are you moving it? Should you have it? Do you want it touching your machine learning model? Um, and then the really big challenge is, can you make sure that the people who are using it know what they're using and understand what it's doing? Um, so we need to make sustainable tech, which I think is generally a theme by the sounds of things across lots of sectors that has been going, been discussed this week. So how is it done here? So at one level, this kind of gives you a, a, an insight into the data science complexity that started getting built. This is, um, you know, we, what sort of features are we going to pull in? So, okay, well, there's how long have they lived at a given address? It kind of gives you some idea of risk of mobility or losing um, accommodation. Uh, whether they live with a partner, whether they have historic issues, you then got their referral history. So you know how much they've been engaging with this sort of service before um, and how long has it been and how long were they dependent on the service in the past? How, how's the new referral come in? So where did it come from? What issues have been flagged? Uh, what benefits are there? What domestic circumstances are there? Um, and then magic um, handle gets cranked. And one note you'll see at the bottom, no free text fields. Um, A, they are very sensitive to what the person writes. Uh, now, interestingly, modern large language models, I wonder whether you could do something more sensible that you could kind of actually use more semantic inference to do it. Back in 2019, not really worrying about it. We'll just throw that away. And they managed to get a working model from the fairly standardized feature set without risk of therefore biases creeping in from using free text. Um, the other challenge with free text is it's prone to leak sensitive information because people don't entirely moderate what they write in a free text box. Um, and so if you just use it freely and you push it out to systems, you can sometimes be at risk of leaking in a bad way. Um, and the idea is that this is going to spit out a score and this is going to, you know, whatever you want it to be, naught to 10, where you then put your thresholds of, is this person at risk of becoming dependent? or not to one if you're going with probability. Now, how do we then put this up? And uh, nicely, we just had a lovely AWS talk where I'm not gonna have to explain some of these terms. Um, uh, but the idea here was to keep things as simple as possible. And one of the ways that we were gonna keep the cost down low is using serverless frameworks, because as has been explained, you only pay for them what you're then using them. You don't have standing infrastructure. Uh, so interestingly, the group here used Zapper actually as their way of doing configurable deployment out to the serviceless ar architecture. And inside that core Lambda function effectively was a, uh, a Flask API uh, engine, which was then hosting the machine learning model, which is going to take in um, a set of criteria from that feature set we just talked about, and it's going to spit back a score. And that's basically all it's going to do. The extras are... S3 is there to keep a track of the models and any training data and model history. So that again, you've got that auditability if you need to go back and investigate. And also you can trigger another Lambda function, which will actually retrain the model and rebuild and save out a new model. And the idea here is therefore, you've still got that front sort of like original pipeline of somebody's going to call in, somebody's going to put data in the system. That system is then going to call up and say, what's the score for this person? And it's going to get added back into that visual basic system. Um, now, uh, this gentleman down here is their tech expert inside the charity who then took ownership of, I know how to go to the retrain endpoint, which triggers the retra model retraining. I know how to check the status. And I can also therefore switch the model back if I need to do like a rollback to an older model or I need to change something. So somebody at the charity took ownership of that part of the tech, but not from a practical implementation, just making sure it was easy enough for them to use what had been built by the volunteers and in the future redeveloped if they needed to. Um, and one of the lessons, which I didn't put the specific one, is you don't need to be flashy. There is their visual basic um, dashboard, and it's still their visual basic, basic dashboard. And the difference is down in the bottom corner, you now get their current score and their future score of dependency risk. And it's rag colored. 
that classic, as much as I hate red, amber, green, because for those poor colorblind people, it's not so helpful. That's what a lot of people expect. And it's therefore simple and it's easy to use and it's integrated fully back into a system that they are comfortable with, which hopefully means that they will use it. Because equally, you don't want to go through all this effort to build something really shiny and flashy, which is so complicated, nobody knows how to use it. And the lovely thing is it costs them £1.20 a month. So when I say low cost sustainable, I mean, this is the thing is they don't have huge, huge volumes of data traffic. And those Lambda servers are sitting up there and it's not really heavy duty. It's not really, but really hardcore, multi-parallel processed or doing anything insane, but it's simple and it's straightforward and it's low cost. It delivered on all of those goals that it needed to do. And they didn't need to explicitly go out and buy any hardware. Um, but it doesn't just end at deploy when you're doing data science. Did it have an impact? Um, you can see that the referral rate started flattening off, but this is a compounded thing of what goes on in society. So I can't lay claim that the model magically started solving the extra referrals and dependency issues. Um, the key thing is that it's being used and it's being trusted by their support worker. Initially, the support worker carried on doing, I'm reading all of the files. But then she realized she was agreeing with the recommendations of the model. And so over the course of time, she trusted it enough that she went, I don't need to keep reading all of these files. I can go down on the floor and actually talk to the people as they come in and get them the help they need to make sure they don't become dependent. And so after nine months, it's entirely integrated into the Welcome Center's uh, business processes. Um, and the audits that have been done have shown that there are very few false positives coming up, but it's actually doing, you know, some really, you know, 10 model based support recommendations were being made per day. So you can go and spend that time speaking to the clients, not reading their files. Um, the impact means that you have earlier interventions. It's time saving. There's more effective client management. There's new ways of working. They can use their time more efficiently to have a bigger impact themselves. But one of the other final lessons is you have to be patient because that was a project 20 years in the making. Um, in 1997, they founded that uh, food bank, but they had no data collection going on at the time. Their initial data co collection system back in 2010 was still an index card system. Um, then they start going into databases. Then there was a data dive hackathon, which started exposing, does it look like they've got, that's where those dependency tales were being found. Those were the insights about the data, which then got bootstrapped into, okay, well, what can we do about that? And that's what turned into the data core project. And then by 2019, yes, they've got machine learning in their day-to-day -day business, actually using it to support their customers. So you can do it, but you, it's baby steps at time and you need to make sure you're tackling the right part of the problem within the organization. And if that's driven a passion in all of you to get involved, then um, you can. Uh, DataKind is always looking for partners at all sorts of levels, uh, whether that's people hosting events or if you work in industry and you wish to donate money to pay for future events, that's also very helpful. Uh, volunteers are always welcome um, of all skill levels at the data dives. We don't do any screening of skills. People come along to learn for the bigger projects we um, do a bit of screening because it's a bigger commitment and we need to know we can deliver. So you need to tailor the volunteer skill sets into what's needed for the projects. Um, as I already mentioned, there's always sponsoring. Um, and we just have a general uh, engagement with uh, social organizations. Uh, so if you need support, if you're working in a charity already, we actually even provide a community to help make sure you don't feel alone. So if you want to stay in touch, you can find DataKind on Twitter, or I should say X, I guess now although I don't like to, um, and LinkedIn, feel free to go to datakind.org.uk. Um, if you email in, you will probably get an invitation into the Slack and you can hear, see the myriad of conversations that happen. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. Uh, from the top, the first question is, our organization has a charity policy where, our, where we are able to take two to five days paid to volunteer for a charitable cause subject to some constraints, is it possible for a team to leverage this to work on a project working only for the volunteer days? Absolutely. Um, I have uh, I know of many people who, and other places that have similar policies. So uh, one level is obviously there's volunteering at the data dive weekends. They're kind of nice and easily done because it's like, it's two days. And so usually, even though it's a weekend, 
you put Monday and Tuesday of the next week, or you took Thursday and Friday off and you tell them, you know, your employer figures that out. I, some people have also done it that they've taken those, they've gone on to large, longer projects, or they've become what we call a data ambassador, where it's a more distributed piece. So it's kind of gets into that four hours a, a week over a more extended period of the time. And sometimes they've been able to get that negotiated that they're effectively taking like a half day a week and they burn it mm -hmm. through that time. Some people have then managed to negotiate a little bit extra and say, well, you know, let me do this whole project out. So I think, like I say, as a community, we're very welcome to take the support and we will, if you need a little bit of a letter to, to, to go back to your employer to say, yes, no, we're offering them a place on this project in order for you to get that signed off. I'm fairly certain you can get an email out of one of the, uh, one of the, uh, team to, to support that activity. Okay, we have a next runner up. What is what is the quality assurance process for these implementations? Who makes the final call about when something is ready to deploy? Oh, that's so over the years, we've tried to bring in a lot of checks and balances ourselves into the process. So when I was talking about core volunteers, um, one of the committees uh, is called the scoping committee, which is meant to be reviewing a, the project specifications to make sure that they are sensible and deliverable. Um, but also they will review at, and check in as projects go. Now, one of the things that you always have to understand is it's on volunteer time. So it kind of doesn't necessarily move at the breakneck pace that you might like to see it because it's a group of volunteers spreading the time out. We can extend those windows if we need to. And it's more about making sure that you make sure you've got a manageable, not an open-ended project definition in the first place which kind of allows you to get to that point so there's ongoing negotiation but i've never encountered a project that's really failed because you try and make sure you define it appropriately and like i say there has to be buy-in from uh the social organization because they're going to have to take some level of ownership by the end of it as well anyway so it's you know it's it's not totally clear-cut but you just you have to manage it um as best you can Okay, there is, uh, the next one is, do you take any data science projects? What are your thoughts on data engineering or building dashboards? How does an organization know if the problem they have is fit for your house? So um, one, I would say you do know how gray a definition data science is. It's anything and anything that touches data one way or another. Um, there are lots of projects which, yes, building dashboards at one end, it's, I mean, you still it is data engineering because it's triaging the data through, turning it into something insightful and putting it in a form. One of the pieces on the most recent project I did was the fact that we were effectively just rendering geospatial areas in a heat map to a degree to make it easier for them to understand the geographical distribution of their data because they couldn't do it in Excel. Again, kind of, I like to use the Excel test. If you can't do it in Excel, they probably can't do it. If you need to use anything more complicated than that, then that's one thing through. So 100%, um, a lot of this involves levels of different levels of data engineering and almost business intelligence, which is why we take people with data skills across the board. On the other side of the organization, knowing if the problem is they have, they have is fit for your help. That's why we have lots of entry points for the charities to engage and find out what it is they want to do. And basically a conversation gets started and that's when if they think it's if we if the advice that we give them is that it's ready to submit a proposal they put in a proposal but if that proposal sort of like fails the scoping committee it'll be on what well can you answer these questions um and it'll just go around in a loop to actually do it the hardest part of the whole thing is onboarding charities that's where all of the work is done is to actually be able to set the projects up okay we have time for a little bit more questions from james turner Build, building ML models which offer or don't offer social support to certain demographics. Sounds like he could be walking on ethical and legal broken glass, he says. Um, do you have internal policy and guidance or is it left to the discretion of the charity and the analyst? We do. And uh, kind of, as I hope I've kind of just already sort of answered, is that it's not like fire and forget anyway, even within the volunteer group. It's always being reviewed by our internal committees and other staff people to check what's going on and to challenge, have you considered this? We have over the years built up um, ethics and bias guidelines and things like that of what you should consider, which is also then feeds back into that scoping about should you, what sort of data should you allow into a project? 
we know that certain types of data will lead you towards biases. And so therefore it's kind of like, do you really need that? Is that sensible or should you just not take it? Um, equally, it's all done in a very open and transparent way again with the charity. And one of the sets of slides that I cut out of this because we didn't have time is you do need to be able to have in that planning the difficult questions. What happens if this goes wrong? How do we protect against that? Or how do we at least catch it if it's going wrong? And what can you therefore do about it to be intervention? So it's mostly about transparency and openness and keeping the conversation going continuously. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for a couple of more questions. So one of which is, how do you avoid volunteer data science work becoming exploitative, especially if early career scientists see it as a good way to gain experience? Depends on what you mean in exploitative, in that any volunteer who wants to walk away can walk away at any point they choose because they're a volunteer. Um, in fact, one of the ways we do the weekends, there's a reason why there is free breakfast, lunch and dinner and uh, alcohol and soft drinks going through the evening. Because if we can entice you to say that you haven't got a good reason to leave, then you stick around for longer. Uh, if, as soon as you say, yeah, head out and go and buy your own dinner somewhere, people don't come back. Um, they, they stay out at dinner. Um, the, one, the thing that has kept me involved for eight years is that it is an incredibly supportive and aware community. If anything... They're, they're driving often in that group for really good working practices in amongst themselves. So I think if ever it felt like it was becoming exploitative, the fact that it's so community driven, the community would push back and challenge in that way. Mm -hmm. Which kind of leads into the next question, I guess. Do the same people work on the entirety of the project? If not, how does the project deal with different deferring ideas from future volunteers is so typically yes so in a in in one of the longer term projects so i mean you've got the data dive weekends that's two days and you're just all the team is there you hack through that day some people might rotate between projects but there's not a huge amount of movement on the longer term projects which are six to nine months the team is typically curated from the start to make sure the skill sets and ne that are needed to deliver it are there although let's say you're working on the dash, you, you're, you've got dashboarding skills. It's like, well, we haven't even done the data pipeline yet. So we'll check in on the meeting so you know what's going on, but you're not going to have any real work to do for three, four months because then it will be your turn to pick up the stick, but you'll be involved in that conversation. Um, so there doesn't tend to be handover, therefore, that you're rotating out in those groups. But people are volunteers, and I have been on projects where someone part way through and said, I can't volunteer my time anymore. Something's happened in my life. I need to step away. And then you have to sub somebody in, but it's within a team of five, six, seven people potentially. So there's enough knowledge to try and bring people back up to speed within in that context. I think I'm afraid we have to uh, call it a day now. Um, there are a number of questions now uh, still in Slido. Uh, perhaps you can post them to Adam directly if yep, you can be reached. To reach out and I will attempt to answer them. 